Thanks for defending. Hi, everyone. I think this is on. Thank you guys for coming today. I'm Erin Burns. I'm the Director of Policy at Carbon 180. First, I just want to say thank you to Senator Barrasso for this room and to Rhodium and BPC for co-hosting this event. We're really excited to be here today. So at Carbon 180, we work on carbon removal for one reason, climate. We need it to get to climate goals, and there are lots of other things about it that are great, like the fact that carbon tech, which is what we call taking CO2 and turning it and using it into the production of uh, commercial products, represents a $1 trillion total available market. The fact that these technologies represent an opportunity to be a part of the solution for extraction communities transitioning to an emissions constrained world and lots of other things. But climate limiting warming to 2 or 1.5 degrees is why we need to be working on carbon removal on direct air capture right now. And it's a good time to be working on these issues. With the passage of updates to 45Q to make direct air capture eligible for the credit for the first time, the introduction and movement of the Use It Act in both the House and Senate, bills to establish the first ever carbon removal R&D program at the federal level, there has been an enormous increase in interest in direct air capture and carbon removal in Congress recently. But to get to the level of deployment we see in climate models and to fully reap the benefits of a circular economy, circular carbon economy, we're going to need even more federal policy support. Luckily, we have a lot of very well-researched, thoroughly vetted ideas on what those policies should be, and that's what we're here to talk about today. We're going to hear first from John Larson, director at the Rhodium Group, about their new report looking at near and long-term policy options for direct air capture. We'll focus today on those near-term options. We've been working with John and his team for about nine months on this report and are really excited to share it. Uh, I say we, but I did want to take a very quick second to shout out two of my colleagues in particular, Rory Jacobson and Matt Lucas, who are not here, um, but who were really involved in the report. After John's presentation, we'll have time for audience questions. Um, we'll then have a panel discussion on the implications of the report's findings and how they fit into the larger conversation on climate and carbon policy. I'll introduce the panelists at this time, but for now, let me hand things over to John.
Thanks, Aaron. Uh, it's great to be here with everybody today in a nice full room. Thanks for everybody for coming. Uh, I want to echo the thanks to BPC for their support in putting uh, the event together and for Carbon 180 for being such a great partner throughout this uh, project. Also wanted to thank the Linden Trust for Conservation and Climate Works Foundation for providing support to do this analysis. And uh, always uh, thanks to the analytical team at Rhodium, Wendy Herndon, Mikhail Grant, uh, for uh, their, their hard work in putting all this together and to Hannah Hess for helping us uh, launch this today. And uh, a little bit quickly about Rhodium. Rhodium's an independent research firm. We've got offices in the United States, China, and Paris. We look at, uh, uh, on the energy and climate team, we look at both the impacts of climate change and quantifying the, uh, the economic challenges ahead and uh, making super hyper-local actionable input for, for key decision making. And then on the energy and mitigation side, we look at energy market and policy analysis for the United States and decarbonization, as well as early stage technology deployment for the kinds of cutting edge uh, tech we're going to need to solve climate change in the long run. And which is why we're here today talking about direct air capture technology. Uh, it's uh, as we'll cover today, this is a, a really, and as Aaron said, this is a really exciting time to be looking at this technology. Uh, it's ready to go, and uh, I think it's, up, uh, it's time for the U.S. to, to get serious about it. So um, I'm going to have a few slides here. You'll see over there, uh, I can barely see them, so hopefully I can pull things off from memory here. Uh, and, um, and then, as Aaron said, we'll have some questions when I'm done. So um, first of all, what is direct air capture technology? It's, it's relatively straightforward. What we've got is a machine that takes ambient air uh, from, from around, um, from the atmosphere. Uh, you add electricity and heat to run the machine and have filters in the machine that, that con connect onto CO2, pull it out of the air, and then another step where you use heat to then uh, separate that CO2 from the filter, producing a concentrated stream of carbon dioxide that can be used in uh, products as a feedstock for chemicals, uh, enhanced oil recovery, uh, made for uh, low carbon fuels. It can also uh, be put underground uh, and safely stored permanently, uh, resulting in a removal of carbon pollution from the atmosphere. Um, we see, we Rhodium see this technology is going to be pretty important uh, if we're going to actually have a chance of meeting climate targets in the U.S. Uh, and we, as part of our, this analysis, we looked out to 2050 and did some of the first medium, uh, mid-century decarbonization analysis that actually explicitly includes direct air capture as part of the solution set and set up some boundary scenarios to see, well, how much of this are we really going to need by 2050 under different climate goals? So we looked at uh, a very ambitious uh, net zero by 2045 and negative thereafter target and then uh, an 83% uh, below 05 by 2050 target. And what we found is uh, when you, when you uh, turn different dials around electrifying end uses or ramping up energy efficiency and decarbonizing the electric power sector and ramping up uh, land uh, carbon removal from farms and forests. All of those things are going to matter to getting us where we need to go. But in pretty much every scenario we looked at, you're going to need a very large amount of direct air capture and storage to actually meet these climate goals. Um, could be uh, up to multiple billions of tons of, of carbon removal from direct air capture, depending on the scenario. Uh, if we're going to need that technology 30 years from now, uh, we better get started today. And where are we right now when it comes to the technology? Well, the good news is it's real. It works. There's real companies building this technology now, deploying it in the field. Uh, there's three leading companies that have attracted uh, tens of millions of dollars of private capital already. Uh, there's 11 direct air capture plants deployed around the, uh, around the globe. The largest one is here in the United States in Alabama, 4,000 tons a year. Um, the, as, as these companies, as well as academics and research labs have been getting their arms around this technology and really understanding it, the, the estimates of what it costs have come down substantially. So if you asked uh, the leading academics how much direct air capture costs just even 18 months ago, you'd get a range somewhere around $600 to $1,000 a ton. That's the big, big bar on the chart here. But uh, based on our analysis and building off of other hard work from both the direct air capture companies and the National Academies of Sciences, we found that uh, the range for the, for the first large scale commercial plant is probably closer to $124 to $325 a ton of carbon removal. That's still 
um, you know, not chump change, but at the same time, uh, it is well within bounds of all the other types of low carbon solutions we're talking about for solving climate change right now. And that's just getting started, right? So with uh, learning by doing and experience, we can actually really, we, we can drive these costs down further. Uh, in addition, there's lots of opportunities for direct air capture today, as well as the broader carbon capture and utilization space. Uh, Aaron mentioned uh, the carbon tech market. Uh, we've, we see, uh, according to Carbon 180, there's a $5 trillion market in carbon tech globally. That's everything from making low carbon fuels to low carbon cement, fertilizer, chemicals. Uh, and globally, there's over 400 million tons of de demand for CO2 today, mostly for enhanced oil recovery, but for other things like beverages and food and um, lots of other applications. So there, there is a market for um, waiting for direct air capture. Uh, the challenge is um, that even with existing policy support through the 45Q tax credit, and uh, California's low carbon fuel standard, which also can provide uh, revenue sources for direct air capture. Other than a few niche opportunities uh, where direct air capture can compete uh, against conventional carbon capture and utilization technologies today, uh, m most of the, uh, the policy support needed to get this technology to scale is not there yet. So the red dots on these charts are basically the break even cost. Um, for our median estimate for direct air capture against different applications for direct air capture. So, you know, if you're doing um, carbon removal, for example, uh, we find that uh, there's, there's somewhere in the uh, $86 per ton uh, value for policy support right now, but you need more like 232 to break even um, for the first commercial plant. So there's certainly a gap between where the technology is today and where the policy support is today. And that's why, uh, that's why we're here on the Hill to talk to you guys about what else, uh, what else the U.S. can do to change this picture. Um, and the U.S. has a really strong track record of investing strongly in R&D &D and setting up deployment policies that can actually catalyze learning by doing, drive down the cost of important low emissions technologies, and get them to scale quickly and uh, into the mainstream. On the left-hand side is the uh, experience of solar PV in the United States, uh, which started off on a levelized cost of energy around 300 bucks a megawatt hour back when we first got, it, got started. Um, a lot of R&D &D was done in the 70s and 80s to get that technology just into the market in the first place. And then through federal uh, tax credits and state uh, renewable energy mandates, uh, the costs have come down dramatically with deployment down uh, by a factor of five uh, over, over the last couple of decades. We see the same thing uh, being available to direct air capture. Uh, on the left-hand side, that first bar in the left-hand chart is uh, our, our first plant estimates of where uh, direct air capture costs are today. We see if you follow uh, an exponential deployment path to the kinds of direct air capture we need by 2050, we see the cost coming down uh, substantially and rapidly with, with greater deployment. Um, that's not going to happen by itself. The U.S. needs to move to, to catalyze this kind of deployment and drive these costs down through uh, learning by doing and scale and building an industry around this technology. But we see even, even in the next decade, if you can get 9 million tons of direct air capture de capacity deployed by 2030, we can drive the costs down by 20 to 30 percent. And that's just making the existing technology better. That's not, that doesn't count any new breakthroughs from RD&D or any of the new, you know, potentially cutting edge technology that's in the lab today. That's just what, what, what's on the shelf. So there's a lot of opportunity. Um, so what can the U.S. do? Well, first of all, investing in R&D &D is going to be important. We need, we need uh, a federal effort to push this technology into the market at scale, uh, just like we saw with solar and with wind and nuclear and lots of other technologies. Uh, and uh, fortunately, the National Academies of Sciences came out with a big carbon dioxide removal report last year that outlined a, a full research and development plan for direct air capture uh, and recommended, on average, $240 million a year over 10 years for funding for this technology. Um, that sounds like a lot, but it's nothing compared to the amounts we spend today on the technologies that are already commercial, uh, such as renewable energy. In, uh, so the green bars here are each of the program offices that uh, uh, have R&D spending, the average 10-year spending for Office of Electricity, for energy efficiency, for renewables. And you can see uh, the direct air capture recommendations from the National Academies are about 40 percent of the smallest program office spending in, in DOE. So there's a... Uh, we, we, uh, the U.S. has plenty of investment in uh, these technologies today, and, uh, and then in the meantime, the U.S. is about middle of the pack when it comes to R&D &D investment globally, and has committed to 
increasing and doubling our D&D uh, over the next several years, director capture looks like a pretty good opportunity to not just uh, add more money to the uh, efforts the U.S. is already pursuing, but actually to expand the portfolio of technologies that we're investing in. Meanwhile, you need technologies that are going to pull the technology, the, uh, you need policies that are going to pull director capture technology into the market. So rd and is key, so is uh, creating new demand for director capture technology and bringing it into the mainstream. Uh, in the report, we've got pages and pages of detail of exactly what uh, we think the U.S. Uh, and Congress should consider uh, under three different pathways. Uh, none of these are mutually exclusive, but we basically identify three different ways that if, if the U.S. were to do one of them at, at the ambition we, we'd outline, it's sufficient to get 9 million tons of direct air capture deployed in the United States through 2030, which is what we see as the first step in getting to scale. Um, one is to leverage government procurement of low carbon products. Uh, this could be through military procurement of low carbon fuels, it, which uh, they've done before with biofuels, for example. It could be uh, low carbon uh, concrete procurement for uh, government building projects. It could also be government procurement of carbon dioxide removal, uh, uh, actually uh, procuring plants that can actually put, uh, take CO2 out of the air and put it safely underground. Uh, the second pathway is to build on the success of the bipartisan 45Q tax credit uh, and expand it for direct air capture in a number of ways. One is to extend the, the tax credit payout period from 12 years to 30. Another is to lower the uh, minimum capture threshold to 10,000 tons per year. Uh, la uh, extending the under construction deadline from the end of 2023 to the end of 2030 for direct air capture and increasing the credit value for direct air capture and uh, carbon removal to 180 bucks a ton from 50. While all of those things sound uh, pretty, pretty ambitious, when you add it all up, supporting 9 million tons of capacity, if you follow this pathway, is going to cost uh, uh, the government a billion and a half dollars a year in 2030. That's half what we spend on solar today in tax credits, so, uh, and a third of what we spend on wind. So again, uh, bringing director capture policy into the mainstream and uh, parity with other technologies that uh, the U.S. has made investments in is, is seems like a, a pretty reasonable when you put it in that context. Uh, the last pathway we looked at here is a federal fuels policy, a clean fuels policy. This could be revisiting the renewable fuel standard and adding in a new tier for uh, super low carbon fuels from any feedstock, not just bio. Uh, we, th we think director capture to fuels uh, powered with low emissions energy can get as low as 90% better than gasoline on a life cycle basis. Uh, and driving, driving a mandate for that from, through the fuels policy is one way to get this done. Uh, another option is just to build a new mandate that's specifically tailored for director capture fuels. Uh, if we do either one of those things, basically the target you need to support 9 million tons of capacity is less than 0.5% of total on-road fuel retail sales in 2017. So not a very large target for, um, to support the level of scale we're talking about for direct air capture in the medium term. There's lots of other policy options that on their own won't be enough to catalyze direct air capture deployment, but can certainly complement deployment efforts. Uh, we looked at a variety of finance policies, like uh, master limited partnership treatment for direct air capture, private activity bonds, a few other things. We also looked at investment tax credits, uh, similar to what solar enjoys today. And we found that uh, uh, holding all else equal and looking at um, a 30% investment tax credit for direct air capture, we could cut the break-even cost for the technology by 50 bucks per ton, um, but, which is uh, basically about 25% of the total levelized cost of the first plant. Uh, that's a really big uh, and important impact that uh, comp could re uh, work well with, uh, in concert with other deployment policies. Uh, there's also non-cost barriers to direct air capture that also apply to a broader set of carbon capture and utilization and storage technologies. We get a, uh, we get a settled monitoring and, and liability rules around, direct air, uh, around carbon removal and, and injection of CO2 into geologic reservoirs. We've got a, a streamline uh, uh, CCS uh, storage permitting as well as pipeline permitting for CO2. Um, and uh, we need to be mapping out the geologic reservoirs uh, available in the United States, really getting to understand the characteristics so we know where the best, where the U.S. Uh, uh, can identify the best priorities for uh, storing CO2 in the long run underground. And, uh, and then finally, uh, 
looking at uh, product standards for carbon utilization. And you know, basically, there, there are uh, real products today that uh, can be made with, with CO2 from uh, point sources and from direct air capture, but they are blocked out of the markets because the standards for uh, uh, procurement are just not uh, don't open the door to these technologies. So that, we need to break through that to get, uh, get more markets available for direct air capture. Uh, and then there are a lot of other policies that uh, the U.S. and Congress contemplate uh, uh, all the time that can be tailored to um, make room for direct air capture. Uh, so, for example, just yesterday, uh, Senator Smith on this side of the Hill and uh, Ben Ray Lujan, a uh, representative from Mexico in, um, in the House, introduced a clean energy standard that would set uh, the U.S. on a course for decarbonization of the electric power sector by mid-century. And in that, they actually do allow crediting of direct air capture uh, and carbon removal as a compliance pathway under that policy, similar to the way California already does for the low carbon fuel standard. Uh, more, more kind of foresight and thinking about how to fold direct air capture into these types of energy policies is gonna be really important to just providing more opportunities. Uh, you can do the same thing with infrastructure. Uh, it should Congress and the President get, get to yes on an infrastructure bill uh, down the road. There's lots of opportunities to uh, require low carbon procurement of building materials and construction materials that could uh, provide new market opportunities for carbon capture and utilization as well as direct air capture. That's gonna be important. Um, down the road, should Congress uh, uh, look seriously at carbon pricing, of which there's been a flurry of uh, legislative activity so far this Congress, making sure that direct air capture carbon removal can get credit uh, uh, through a, a, a tax credit refund or, or some other way to monetize uh, carbon removal under those frameworks is going to be really important. Um, and lastly, uh, if there uh, if there happens to be a movement towards more of a direct government role in dealing with the problem of climate change, uh, the government itself could get into the business of carbon removal and uh, using direct air capture to uh, to to accomplish that. Um, so just to wrap up. Uh, Director capture technology is ready to go in the U.S. The U.S., um, it's time for the director capture to get put into the broader portfolio of solutions where we need for a low emissions future. The uh, U.S. can leverage its experience with enhanced oil recovery and uh, carbon capture and storage, as well as its uh, CO2 infrastructure around the country to really get director capture up to scale. Um, this is a, a kind of a unique opportunity for the U.S. in that response in respect. And then in addition to that, the U.S. has trillions of tons of carbon sequestration capacity more than any other country on Earth. This is, an, another, again, another opportunity uh, for the U.S. to lead. And then finally, uh, uh, the U.S. needs to get started now in pursuing policies that are going to make this happen. It's, it's, none of this is going to happen on its own. We're, uh, we're fortunate that the uh, uh, diligent work from uh, the director capture companies and academics have gotten us this far, but now it's time for the U.S. to step up and really get this to scale. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop uh, and say thanks and take your questions. So when we do have questions, there's a mic to the, in the middle of the room there. So uh, when you come up, please uh, state your name and affiliation and put your question in the form of a question. Please. Uh, Nicholas, did you have your hand up? Oh, thank you. Hi, Nicholas Eisenberger, Global Thermostat, uh, direct air capture company, the only U.S.-based direct air capture company. Uh, this is terrific. Thank you. Um, uh, it's, it's, in some ways, I will get to a form of a question. In some ways, um, it's uh, hard to believe this is happening after uh, a decade of working in this area with people not really understanding the importance of direct air capture to have a whole Senate building um, uh, meeting on this discussion on this topic is really wonderful and well needed. Um, my question is, um, you talked about incentives for uh, carbon pricing. This is a longer term discussion, which I don't think really is where we should start the conversation, but I'm trying to fill um, uh, opportunity for questions here. Uh, do you see a, a, a world in which um, you might preference removal versus um, mitigation of uh, CO2? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, we looked at this pretty hard, and to be honest, when we started, I was, I, I, uh, we, most of the work Rhodium does is all on mitigation. 
right? If we look at decarbonizing energy systems uh, around the world in the, in the U.S., uh, the, the one, and there's a, there's a very large discussion in the report that explores what, with what the U.S. needs to go, do to really decarbonize by 2050. I showed you one chart. There's a lot more to, under the hood. Um, what we found is you got to do everything. Uh, so it's really not a either or, mitigation or carbon removal. You've got to dial up efficiency all the way. You've got to electrify as much as you can. You've got to de decarbonize the power sector. And you need carbon removal from all sorts of opportunities, not just uh, one, one favorite option. Like, like if it's not just a natural sequestration play. It's not just bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. You need as many different options on the table if we're going to succeed. And so carbon removal from direct air capture uh, we find to be poised for takeoff to play an important role in all this, uh, but uh, it, shouldn't it shouldn't be the only place the U.S. focuses. We need to be focusing on all fronts. Hi, um, Aaron Smith. Um, I know you had mentioned um, some of the building materials that CO2 source from direct air capture can be used for. I'm wondering if you can speak to the state of play for how some of that um, CO2 is used today um, and sort of the market opportunity for, for going forward. Sure. I mean, there are companies out there now, uh, startups that actually have concrete that's as good, if not better, than conventional concrete and aggregate. Uh, and one of the key feedstocks in that product is, is CO2 from somewhere. Uh, and uh, either captured out of smokestack or, or from the atmosphere. Um, there's, you know, they're attracting uh, probably even more private capital than the direct air capture, capture companies themselves right now. And, um, you know, I think uh, Carbon 180 may have more, more to say about this, or the panel may have more to say about the market opportunities. But uh, there's, there are a lot of companies attracting, um, doing some really interesting things on this front uh, that could really change what we think of as concrete, for example. Um, we're also seeing the same thing in steel. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of other uh, fronts. And then in the meantime, you know, CO2 can be used for carbon fiber uh, and lots of other important technologies. What, one thing I will say is we find utilization as a really important stepping stone for carbon capture, uh, for direct air capture, especially in the near and medium term. That's why we focused a lot of our policy recommendations on that front. But in the long run, we're still going to need a very large amount of carbon removal out of this. So, so the, the market opportunities are huge and important in getting this to scale, and then we need the next step after that. Um, question? Uh, Jay Kennedy from Environment and Public Works Committee. Is there any discussion in the report about the need for CO2 pipelines to kind of increase the chance for utilization? Uh, we talk about it a little bit. Direct air capture is kind of a unique technology in the, in the CO2 infrastructure space because you can site it where the demand is. So you don't necessarily need a very large pipeline infrastructure to support direct air capture uh, and utilization because you can literally put the plant next to the factory where you need the, the CO2, um, which is uh, really interesting. Uh, it also provides some interesting opportunities for expanding uh, other applications of uh, CO2 utilization, like enhanced oil recovery, where you, you now makes it direct air capture makes it possible to do EOR in places where there are no pipelines, um, which is also you know as long as there's access to affordable low carbon energy, you can actually get a climate benefit out of that. Um, so. Uh, we do talk a bit about pipelines because I wouldn't rule out the need for any of that to support scale up here at some degree. Um, but direct air capture itself is um, uh, kind of unique in that space. Uh, we do point out that there are policy options on the table now to, to streamline permitting of CO2 pipelines and how that could be certainly be of help, uh, say, through the USIT Act and things like that. Um, but uh, uh, in, the, in the long run, we focus more on the, uh, the, the technology itself as opposed to the, you know, all of the different infrastructure pieces. Hi, Lynn Brickett, um, Office of Fossil Energy. I have a question and a comment. So your um, conclusion slide said leverage the research in CCUS, which I think is really important. But earlier I noticed you had a bullet that said something like map the geological storage yep. areas, which I think is inconsistent with that since we've been doing that for 20 years. We have like everything in the U.S. mapped, certainly onshore, and now we're even moving to offshore. So I just want to make sure, you know, we're, we always have limited 
money available, limited resources, so we don't want to duplicate effort because that's, that's out there. It's available. The, geologic, the storage program through NETL and False Energy has been doing that and has really done it very well. And they absolutely have. Totally agree. Uh, I think what we're suggesting here is taking it to the next level, so the carbon safe project uh, you know, efforts that are going on now to actually really get to know each individual geologic opportunity and characterizing it so that uh, when demand is there for storage, uh, uh, project developers know exactly what they're dealing with on a particular site is kind of the next level, and that's what we're really talking about. Okay. Yeah. And then just, and I, everyone says this about air capture, and I just, I need someone to help me understand this. <laughs> um, obviously, the novelty of air capture is it can be located anywhere, which is great. But this idea that you're not going to need a pipeline, so our experience with Petronova is that when we tried to build Petronova at the original size at the, with the money that the government had available to give to that project, they increased it, they doubled it, because their offtake agreement was so much. Mm -hmm. So for EOR, they needed that much CO2. Mm -hmm. So I struggle understanding how, so like in my mind, how air capture works is you have primary capture, you have utilization. I mean, I agree with what your comment was. I think this is like, this is like a big hamburger. We have to put everything on it, right? We need utilization, we need EOR, yep. we need air capture. And you have to work the synergies together because sure. that's really how the economics play the best. Um, so the, this idea that we don't need a pipeline and we're just gonna use air capture for EOR, I struggle that any oil company would have enough CO2 available, again, based on the Petronova experience, to actually say, well, we're going to put an air capture unit in that's the size of Washington, D.C., in order to get enough CO2 to, EO, to do EOR. So I think, and what I'm saying is I think that message, which is confusing to me, and I think I know a little bit, so I think that message needs to be, as, as a group, when we all talk about direct air capture and how it's needed, we kind of need to work on that message so it makes a little more sense. Or maybe you have the answer that will make sense to me. Well, I mean, I, I think maybe it's important to clarify. We need CO2 pipelines in America. I've just pointed out that direct air capture technology itself doesn't, doesn't inherently need it in every application. So, that, so, I mean, maybe, maybe to channel, I think, where you're going with this, which is there is a broader need for CCUS infrastructure generally if we're going to decarbonize. And when, in that conversation, absolutely, carbon, CO2 pipelines are a key part of that infrastructure. Uh, we had the benefit of only looking at this one carbon capture technology in this effort. And, and the unique thing about direct air capture is that uh, you don't inherently need pipelines in every application. That said, uh, back to the, the uh, footprint of direct air capture for a second. Uh, another interesting thing is the, the actual like land use constant uh, footprint for these machines is actually relatively small, surprisingly small, compared to say the CO2 sequestration capability of, of natural, like forests and land. Um, and the, the type of million ton capacity plant you might need for a remote EOR application is probably no bigger than your uh, average size coal plant in America, not, not all of Washington, D.C. Um, and so that's a really interesting proposition here, where it's, you know, I mean, these are big machines, but they aren't that big. And, uh, and they can also go uh, scale up vertically and not horizontally, so you can actually be stacking them up into the atmosphere to get, um, to minimize the land impact. So there's some interesting other opportunities there. I agree, I, I mean, is somebody gonna tomorrow do director capture in an EOR like way out in the middle of nowhere? Probably not, but it is an interesting proposition given the characteristics of the technology. Hi, uh, Julia Selker. When you talk about uh, the cost of carbon capture, are you talking about uh, direct air capture? Are you talking about normal air or directly from a pollution stream like Petronova? And what's the difference in the cost? Um, all the numbers you saw in this presentation are from from the atmosphere. There is this is this is not the same thing as um, none of those numbers reflect the cost of capture from a uh, point source, from a smokestack, or uh, anything like that. Uh, there's other experts in the room that spend all of their time on, on carbon capture from, from uh, industrial sources and could probably give you a lot more detail on, on how the numbers differ. It tends to be cheaper for point source capture than director capture, at least today. Um, again, that's one, one reason is it's benefited from a lot more R&D and D investment and uh, deployment activities compared to where this technology is. Um, that said, um, the, uh, uh, 
we, we see these costs as actually surprisingly reasonable given the state of the technology and where it is and where, and where it could go, which is uh, super, super exciting. Um, I think we have time up. Maybe one more question briefly. Yeah. Hi, uh, Nader Sabani from the Niskanen Center. So a uh, 2013 study by the National Research Council found that extending the subsidy programs for wind and solar uh, would cost, uh, would reduce emissions at a uh, per ton cost of $250, which is a good chunk of the cost yeah. of the uh, direct air capture technology. So I was wondering, how should we harmonize um, our approach to low carbon technology so that we're not picking winners and losers and just letting the market sort it out? Um, I hope we get there. <laughs> uh, you, the U.S. doesn't have a track record of, of being, you know, as, uh, as much as we like to say we're not picking winners and losers, uh, we tend to pick winners and losers. Uh, that said, if one were to go that step, uh, you know, we say in the report that in the long run, uh, you basically have um, two options to support carbon removal with direct air capture in the long run. One is a straight up federal procurement exercise that just scales up over time to the, to the level of need, we need we're seeing in our modeling. Um, or, and, and if you're going to do that, you still need to do all the other decarbonization actions that matter to getting emissions down. Or um, you do a carbon price of some sort, cap and trade or carbon tax, that is uh, sufficiently high enough to drive investment in both low carbon technologies. Uh, on an even playing field, as you were saying, um, and carbon dioxide removal. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot more uh, study in how to, how to do that right to make sure that director capture um, fits appropriately in there. And we've, we've got a lot of that in the report um, and happy to talk with you guys more about it. But, uh, at, you know, at the end of the day, that, that would be the ideal scenario. Um, I hope we get there. <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see what happens. Cool. Time's up, everybody. So thank you again. Uh, I'm looking forward to the panel. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and thanks again. The report's live on uh, rhg.com, so please, uh, please go download it. So thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, I'd like to welcome the panel up. So we have Lori Gaitre, Director of Strategic Business Development at Carbon Engineering. Dr. Addison Stark, Associate Director for Energy Innovation at BPC. Dr. Atasha Cave, Founder of Opus 12. And Hilary Moffitt, Senior Director of Government Affairs at Occidental Petroleum. So thank you guys for being here. I just wanted to start, I want to hear from Lori and Atasha. Can you guys talk a little more about what your companies do and why this is the field y'all have chosen? Either of you can go first. Thanks very much, Erin, and thanks to um, everyone for hosting and for the fantastic uh, comprehensive uh, work that Rhodium did and Carbon 180 on, on this report. Uh, carbon engineering, direct air capture technology, we've been working on direct air capture for the last 10 years. Um, and have developed a technology that will pro I'll move closer to the mic. Actually, I'll, here, I'll pull it back. Thanks so much. Um, working on direct air capture for the last 10 years uh, and have a technology um, that we're taking to market. I, I think, as, as John said, uh, it's real. It works. Um, we've been operating our pilot plant since 2015, pulling uh, uh, carbon dioxide out of the air, uh, and we're, we're ready to commercialize this technology. Why am I working on this? Uh, we, we have too much carbon dioxide in the air, and this is one of the most important um, problems facing humanity today. So I'm incredibly excited and motivated uh, to get to work on this problem. Yes, and I'm the co-founder at Opus 12, and we basically um, do CO2 utilization. So we take CO2 from uh, direct air capture sources or point emission sources, and we convert that CO2 into higher value products. And we do that by using electricity and metal catalyst. And so what actually happens is the CO2 and a water molecule is broken down into smaller atomic bits and then reformed into new molecules with the help of the metal catalyst and electricity. So we can make things like a carbon negative plastic or a carbon neutral fuel, such as diesel fuel or ethanol. Um, and we're looking forward to coupling with um, CO2 emission sources, converting that into more fuel. So for example, um, one customer that we've uh, really accelerated talks with now that, we've, that this new 45Q law has been put in place is a, a cellulosic corn ethanol plant in California. 
And this plant, of course, emits CO2, as, as most ethanol plants do. And we can take that CO2 and convert it into uh, more fuel for them to sell. So it lowers the carbon score of their entire plant. And they also increase their revenue um, by taking this former waste product that they were going to be throwing into the atmosphere and actually make, making more of a usable, sellable product for them. So we have our first commercial unit that's a, a five kilowatt system that's about the size of a dishwasher. And we're scaling up to our larger systems that'll um, be the size of a, of a typical plant. And at scale, um, um, the CO2 conversion power of one of our uh, core components, which is about the size of a check-in suitcase, um, within that uh, suitcase size unit, you would have the CO2 conversion power of about 37,000 trees. So we're really excited about uh, scaling up to that and reaching that level. Great. And Lori, John talked a lot about the kind of state of play with carbon removal with direct air capture now, long term, really kind of broad um, kind of how we see the future of this and the role of federal policy. But you guys are doing this right now. Can you talk a little? I realize my mic wasn't on. I'm just really loud. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the market opportunities you guys see right now? Sure. So um, John uh, talked a bit about the different kinds of policies that support um, the certainly the 45Q <coughs> tax credit uh, is a you know a, a terrific way of incentivizing, motivating uh, work on carbon capture, capture utilization and storage uh, that will benefit um, the plants when they roll out. Uh, new policy on the scene, uh, the change to the, the California low carbon fuel standard in January will, um, will award LCFS credits to the permanent sequestration of atmospheric CO2 uh, if it complies with the California CCS protocol. Uh, so that's another really important policy uh, that's in place that will help to, to pull the commercial um, implementation of direct air capture through. Great. And, and on those market opportunities, Hillary, Oxy recently invested really significantly in carbon engineering. Can you talk a little more about that decision and the role you guys see in your future, in Oxy's future, for direct air capture? Sure. Um, so Oxidental has been injecting CO2 for enhanced oil recovery for over 40 years. Uh, we use industrial, we use naturally occurring, and we use recycled sources of CO2 to get anywhere from 10 to 25 percent more oil out of the ground. Um, so we use it as a tertiary recovery method. So after your sort of primary recovery and then more of a, a secondary recovery using water, we can use um, CO2 and we get a lot more oil that otherwise would not be recoverable. So that's sort of the use today. Um, you know, we see, we, right now we inject about 2.6 billion cubic feet of CO2 per, um, or, and that's about 50 million metric tons. So we're already using a lot of CO2 um, and we see the technology like direct air capture um, and, and, and others as a way to transition to the low carbon economy in a way that continues to use, you know, oil and gas and sort of domestic reliable energy sources while decreasing emissions. So we see, we see tremendous opportunity here for, for more CO2 to be used as, as enhanced oil recovery. But also, at this point, EOR has made carbon capture um, begin to, to the, the economics are starting to make much more sense than they used to. And part of that is in, is in large part due to EOR and the demand for, for CO2 there. So we see this as a way to help scale carbon capture technology across the board. Um, you know, starting with EOR and then moving into some of these other products and using it as a feedstock in other places. Um, you know, from our perspective, the IEA says that a barrel of oil produced with industrial sources of CO2 has a lower carbon footprint by about 63%. Um, so we're really excited about what we're doing from, from the energy perspective using CO2, and, and we'd love to see more sources of it especially as we transition to a low carbon economy. Thanks. And you mentioned uh, kind of the policy overlaps with carbon capture. Um, Addison, I was wondering, you know, we see in 45Q and use it that a lot of these things are that the carbon capture, carbon removal are really tied together and we see some overlaps on the policy needs for both of those technologies. Can you talk a little bit about how those, um, kind of where we see some of the, those overlaps on the 
technology development side, some of the things that can be done at the R&D level, some of the deployment policies, so things like 45Q where there, are, where there are overlaps, and places where direct air capture has some unique needs that are separate from larger questions of how we uh, develop carbon capture technology, which, as Lynn pointed out, we've been doing for a really long time at the federal level, whereas you know, we're, the, the efforts on direct air capture at the federal level are, are a little bit newer. Right. So I think the way to contextualize that is right now direct air capture technology is kind of at the beginning of the, the full-on innovation life cycle um, and would really benefit from really focused support of research and development both at the basic scale to be able to develop better membranes, to be able to be develop better separation techniques. Because right now if you look at it, there are, what, five players as John had pointed out. For, and you know, there's more innovators out there, university labs that are working in this space to bring better technology out. Um, so it'd really be a mix of you know, really looking at basic R&D, applied R&D, and then also moving out into be able to support development and deployment. Um, you know, think about how do we how do we um, actually show um, demonstration scales that um, right now, as we can see from a lot of the analysis in this report are going to be very expensive undertakings and very hard to bank today. You need to be able to do more technology de-risking. And right now we see that some of these companies have been able to go out and access some, you know, really um, interesting private support with some really forward-thinking companies. But as you think about the amount of money that it requires to scale in, in industrial chemistry, in energy technologies in general, the traditional venture model does not fully ap uh, um, apply here. So we need to think about how the the Department of Energy can go out and do larger public and private uh, partnership in this space and support uh, demonstration scale. I think that's the critical need right now. Some of the uh, levels of deployment in the Rhodium Report are, I mean, based on climate models, are really ambitious. I, John touched on this a little bit, but um, you know, how do you see the, f the role of the federal government, the history of us, kind of the, the U.S. in particular? Um, the experience we have scaling up new technologies like that. How do you see those sorts of the, those sorts of experiences applying to the federal government tackling direct air capture at the scale we're talking about in the Rhodium report? Um, if you if you remember one of the plots that John showed, it um, really the early on learning curve um, gains are very fast for most technology. If you look at how quickly the costs of um, solar decreased during the first you know, um, thousand installations is more important than the next thousand <clears throat> in just being able to get economic gains. And I think we need to think in that framework that not only do we need to be able to get better um, basic understanding, but really recognize that the benefits of R&D and learning and manufacturing scale will play out as um, things are, are built. And so um, what we've done before, when you look at how wind and solar was supported early on and maintained long-term support, similarly here, you need to think that um, just by building, you know, we learn. And learning curves are a very real phenomenon that are generally the most powerful tool we have in technology development. You mentioned the venture model. And Natasha, I wanted to ask how you see the role of federal policy helping startups specifically. The updates to the 45Q tax credit that were enacted last year not only made direct air capture eligible, but lowered some of those thresholds. Um, how should policymakers be thinking about helping the dozens of new companies in the carbon tax space um, when they're developing new legislation? Yeah, absolutely. So a couple of things on that. So one, um, lowering the, the threshold in the 45Q uh, law was, was directly helpful for, to us. Like the cellulosic ethanol plant that we've been talking with, um, they emit about 100 uh, tons of CO2 per year. So we were able to uh, accelerate talks with them because now they have this uh, tax credit that they can now uh, leverage and make the economics uh, work even better and faster for them. Um, so that, that was like a direct help. Um, for us, because we are starting small and going to grow into um, a much larger space where we would, um, you know, be at the the upper threshold. But for starting off, like it's it's really helpful to have those lower thresholds so we can get those early customers in. And in terms of policy support, you know, we've um, we've been really grateful to be able to leverage support from the Department of Energy. We've gotten support from BDO and ETL, and these entities um, have been super helpful for us to attract private investors. When we say, oh, we have this DOE grant that's directly supporting this, those investors know that that grant has been thoroughly vetted by um, uh, you know, review board of, of professors and, and, and experts in the space, so they, they trust the technology more. 
And they also know that, um, that we're going to hit our milestones and we're going to stay on, on top of this and that their money is being leveraged um, through, through public funding. So what, one thing that we would love to see is that you know, we've gotten support at this sort of basic R&D level. We've built our first commercial product. It's in our lab. In fact, if anyone's in Berkeley and wants to come check it out, we're super proud of it. We're happy to give you a tour of our lab. Um, and now as we start to think about deploying it, we see that there is kind of a hole in, in the support and funding for us to get those first um, initial customers to, to do a public-private partnership where we're actually deploying the technology, actually building those first plants. And so that is where I would say like policy can really, really be helpful there by making sure that those first few plants get off the ground. I think that was mentioned earlier. Um, and, and we certainly see that hole in the market. And then we... It, you know, there is existing, you know, once we're at scale, once we're a large company, there's, there's already existing sort of loan guarantees, and that's also great to have that once we're at scale. But just right in that middle, there seems to be some missing policy in that. And I think there were some great suggestions that were offered in the Rhodium report on, on how we can meet that. Thank you. Um, you know, I, we've been talking a lot about this for climate goals, but one of the things that John uh, talked about in the, the Rhodium report is some of the near-term opportunities to deploy carbon removal, to deploy direct air capture, are where you take the CO2 and then use it for something like enhanced oil recovery or fuels or something where the CO2 then is released back into the atmosphere. How do you guys see those types of uses? And, and of course, there are other opportunities where the CO2 is used in, in carbon, you know, in, in products where it's where it's stored permanently or for a very long time, or there's geologic storage opportunities. Um, but in the near term, what we're, we're a lot of this is enhanced oil recovery, is fuels, that sort of thing. This is for anybody, any any and all of you who want to comment. But how do you guys think about the role of deployment um, of carbon of, of direct air capture? where the CO2 is used for non-permanent sequestration of CO2. How does that fit in for you guys in the long-term vision of, of direct air capture being deployed ultimately to you know, meet, meet long-term climate goals? I'll take this on. Oh, we think about this a lot. Um, uh, I guess for us, uh, the use of direct air capture, um, even if it's used in um, a fuel that will then be burned and, and re-emitted, or, or in a, a situation like in Hatswell recovery might, where not all of it might stay down. Um, at the very least, what we've done is recycle the carbon in the atmosphere rather than pull some new carbon up. So we haven't, we've recycled it, put it, taken it out, put it back up, um, and avoided a new ton of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So, so that's, that's great. Um, it also then uh, allows us to innovate and get to um, the point where we're, we're also just doing pure sequestration projects. Um, and, we should get Hillary to mention it again, because Hillary mentioned some of the EOR metrics that's, that sh have shown that um, quite a lot of the carbon dioxide stays under t underground, even with conventional EOR. Well, and I'll just add, too, that, that we look at it sort of as, as an entire life cycle. So, and, and I will actually mention pipelines here, too, because, you know, we love direct air capture. We love carbon capture from a point source. And we would love to see more pipelines so that we could move that. You know, certainly we can have co-location at, at EOR facilities. We'd love to see pipelines so that we could move CO2 to, to EOR facilities. But, you know, we're also looking at it because direct air capture requires a lot of energy. In fact, a third of our energy needs at an EOR facility um, you know, we're, we're trying to look at for renewables. We just built, um, or we're in the process of building a 16 megawatt solar facility at one of our EOR sites. So we're trying to look at it very holistically from the perspective of, you know, we can take, we can take carbon dioxide from an industrial source. We can use it for enhanced oil recovery. You can take that oil and you can blend it with ethanol, which is a lower carbon footprint. So then all of a sudden you're decreasing this oil over and over and over again. Then you can capture the emissions from the ethanol facility and you can use those captured emissions back in your enhanced oil recovery. So we see it as very cyclical and trying to decrease every step along the way, including our electricity usage, um, including all of our inputs. And, and so we see it as sort of a looking at every step. Aaron, just to go back to your original question also, um, early on, you're going to have to look for niche applications for any technology that really allow you to go and do projects that you can be net revenue positive. 
I think that's really important to think about that. So it's not just worrying about where the CO2 is going initially. You need to be able to be going down that learning curve for the direct air capture technology itself. Um, this is something that while I was at RPE, we would look at this about all the technologies we invest in. You know, a lot of the things I was working on in thermal engineering, um, our first partners were the DOD helping to understand how technologies can go in and really look at niche applications where the cost profiles are different and the willingness to pay for a technology is very different than what you would look at when you start to move into um, large scale and volume plays, but also in particular when you're moving on and doing full storage of CO2, um, the economics there are going to be really completely price constrained and you're going to have to have really low uh, marginal costs of direct air capture in new plants. So you really need to take those niche applications first. Sorry about that, Avtasha. Yeah, no, <laughs> I thought you were finished, sorry. Never. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, the way that I characterize it is that, um, you know, per the laws of physics, you're not going to fly a 200-passenger intercontinental plane using solar. You know, you're not going to go back to fully wind-powered cargo ships that are inter-oceanic. It's just the energy density of liquid fuels are just unique and we've built this infrastructure around them. And so even in a world where we've like completely decarbonized the grid, if we want to continue to have 200 passenger planes and c cargo ships, which I think we will in, that, in this futuristic world, then we need to think about recycling that fuel. And, and to me, taking the CO2 from emissions and recycling it and creating CO2 neutral fuels is the future that we would want to build. Um, so that's, that's how I see kind of this carbon neutral um, debate that it, it just, it, liquid fuels are just amazing in their energy density and that uh, we should continue to make them and use them. Hillary, how do you guys see, you know, Oxy's future, kind of a carbon constrained world? We're seeing a lot more policy around, um, you know, reducing, constraining, taxing emissions. How do you guys see the role of oil in the future versus the role of kind of CO2 based liquid fuels that we're talking about developing here? Um, so I mentioned, Oxy is unique because we very much are sort of an all of the above oil company. Um, and, and I think that we're excited about all these opportunities. You know, our CEO is, is a big believer that, that not only do we need to act on climate, but we can make a business out of it. And so we see a continued need for, li for liquid f fuels, oil and gas especially. Um, you know, all the estimates suggest that's going to keep rising over the next 20 to 30 years. Um, and, and we see the need to provide domestic reliable energy sources in that way. We are also very excited about new opportunities to decarbonize the, the transportation sector, which has historically been difficult, um, you know, and, and looking at other ways. Like I said, we partner with, with ethanol facilities. We partner, we're working on solar grids. Some of our chemical facilities, we actually use hydrogen cogen to help power that. So we're really looking at all different types of options here. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're have been very excited about the work of Carbon Engineering and we're investors in, in that company and, and are really excited to see what they do. Um, I think that we are well positioned for the transition to a low carbon economy because of our understanding of, of CO2 and enhanced oil recovery, but also working with incredibly smart people like the folks up here and understanding what the opportunities are for the next steps. Natasha, how do you guys see the kind of carbon tech, carbon use market outside of enhanced oil recovery? Obviously, this is something that you guys are a leader in and, and have worked in that you personally have worked in for a while. Um, can you just step back for a second? We talked kind of briefly about general market opportunities. Uh, carbon 180 has a report out, um, actually, that my two colleagues I gave a shout out to earlier are also the, the authors on, um, showing that there are these enormous market opportunities. It's nearly $6 trillion globally uh, total available market. Uh, one trillion domestically. How do you guys think about the the kind of carbon tech field? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, when I first started out in this, um, right after my graduate school work, you know, I certainly wanted to have the hugest impact, which I think is you know at scale. You know, carbon neutral fuels is, is the best way to kind of bring the impact um, in terms of CO two mitigation. And then as I started building the company, I realized that in order to create a great company, we, we need to bring in revenue early, show uh, that the technology works early, and, and have kind of market, uh, market share, market penetration um, early on. And so um, in realizing that, 
it makes just a lot of sense to start making these carbon negative products. Um, consumers want them. They want to know that the shoes and the clothes that they're wearing um, have a lower environmental footprint. Um, you know, the the materials that, that go into making these clothes are actually a, um, a small part of the actual retail amount you're paying. So um, for a company such as, you know, a consumer brand, let's say um, Nike or, or um, a clothing brand, for them to add our component in is not going to change their economics quite substan like too substantially. Uh, but they have this extra branding tool now to say like there's CO2 negative products in their in their uh, clothing or their shoes. Um, so we've uh, been um, trying to leverage that as much as possible and really connect with customers and form strategic partnerships um, and really make sure that we have also consumer awareness that. Um, because, you know, a carbon negative shoe might look just like a non-carbon negative shoe. And so making sure that that message gets out that, that this technology exists, it was work, you're wearing it, and um, have that in the product. And that way that will allow us to bring in revenue, show the technology works, get the long-term data, um, and then we can grow the company and then have that large-scale impact where we're making fuels, where the margins are much tighter and, and our performance has to be super strong and we have to show extreme reliability and long-term data. And so we're... Um, we just see this as a really great way to fit within the economic system that, we, that we're operating in. Right. Um, Addison, Natasha, either we, when we think about carbon tech, what are the kinds of policies that you guys think would be most impactful broadly for this kind of sector? What are the, um, you know, John touched on things like procurement, and there were some of the things, you know, building out a carbon tech market is one way to help uh, drive deployment of, of uh, direct air capture. It's also beneficial, as we talked about, some of these policies are helpful not just for direct air capture, but for carbon capture on industrial and power sources. Kind of what, you know, just broadly, what are the kinds of things that are going to help this, um, this sector grow and uh, further commercialize? You know, this goes back to a little bit of what I was talking about before, but now that we've heard more about kind of the technological outlets of where does this um, CO2 go, um, it's also broad-based R&D support of utilization pathways. And in particular, you can think about things like uh, support of basic research in uh, organic chemistry where you start to rethink, you know, where does your carbon come from? No longer is it coming from a, a hydrocarbon or, or methane, but how do you start from CO2 from a very different form of carbon? Uh, I could get very sciencey for a while, but I won't. Um, and really rethink how do you start from the fundamental building blocks and build a lot of the materials we use today. Because everything we're wearing, um, a lot of the materials around us, everything in front of us has different carbons in it that we need to know how we get pathways to it. So. Fundamentally, if we're really thinking about a full carbon tech economy that you guys are thinking about a lot, there's a lot of research that needs to be done today for it to scale up into the future. That's the most important thing that we look at today. Um, then, of course, all these procurement, um, you know, think about how do you actually drive the learning curves. So, yes, procurement and increasing volume of utilization or capture just really driving the need for it is going to be critically important for the learning curves on the large industrial applications. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I, I think a, a robust carbon tech market supports all players. So certainly having more companies that can show that we can make different products out of CO2 um, would just be helpful. The more success stories, the more investors come online, the more funding there is, the more the, um, the cost goes down and the, the market will grow. Um, so I, I think the you know as much as we can just support the, the market broadly and the technologies uh, very broadly, I think that's super helpful for any sort of deployment. Addison, you mentioned some of the niche applications for direct air capture and that we're going to see, um, you know, some of the first movement on direct air capture in these kind of niche places. I have two questions. One is, can you talk a little bit about where we see the, where we see it deployed right now, some of those kind of niche applications, but also, you know, and for Lori too, what are the things that policymakers, I know in some of the conversations we've had recently in the past couple of days when we've talked to people about this report, we've talked about applications um, through the Department of Defense or, you know, fuels applications, really kind of very specific things. What are some of those you guys see in the next kind of five or ten years? And how do you think policymakers should be thinking about how to incentivize those kind of first movers, those niche applications? I think probably it would be nice to hear from Lori on this, um, just because it would be interesting to see who everyone's making their deals with for procurement. <laughs> but the things I read about um, now that I'm excited about, you know, the first movers, it really probably has a, a better um, economic 
um, incentive is the beverages market. I think that that's an exciting space. Um, I know that you guys are doing that. And, you know, but, but that's one of those places where you can really see that it, it starts to go towards the idea of what John's talking about that, you know, and, you know, a little bit of a thing like you can cite this, you can get CO2 where you need it. So thinking about small, um, niche chemical in industry, you might, or these very remote applications that maybe Oxy will start to run into the future, um, that you need CO2 and you don't want to truck it in anymore, or you can really become self-reliant. Um, that'd be an interesting first modular application, but I'd like to hear where else you guys are looking. <laughs> So, so I guess in terms of policy and what we're looking for, um, we're looking for, these plants take a lot of capital to build. And so we're looking for durable um, market-based mechanisms that send a signal that this, is, this market is here to stay and allow us to understand where does it make sense for us to invest and innovate so that we can make solutions for those markets. Um, certainly in terms of markets that is, exist today, we look, of course, at the United States market, but also what's happening globally. Uh, so California has continued to pioneer with their low-carbon fuel standard policies that reward use of carbon dioxide, um, including now the sequestration of atmospheric CO2, uh, but they're not the only ones. So they pioneered other um, low-carbon fuel standards around the world are contemplating also adding the same kind of uh, policy that California has done for the sequestration. Um, in terms of other policies, of course, fuel policies are there today to reward um, very low carbon f uh, fuels. Uh, and so again, in the United States and also uh, globally, um, we, we've, we create, we've created dropping compatible diesel and jet fuel up at our plant in British Columbia. Um, and uh, the creation of those low carbon fuels we see is, is a very, very large market um, and, and growing market internationally as well. So we see both, both the recycling use of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into uh, fuel enhanced oil recovery and also sequestration projects as being um, needing very large volumes of CO2, which we will bring and, uh, and making, economic, make, making the economics work. Great. And you talked about um, international, what's happening internationally. You guys are a Canadian company, uh, Climeworks also, uh, well, no, I was going to say also in Europe. They're in Europe. Y'all aren't. Y'all in Canada. We have one uh, American uh, director capture company. What do you guys think of as the role on the technology development side? I think, you know, whether that's between governments, across companies, coordination, thinking about um, uh, kind of how international cooperation plays a role in deployment of, of these technologies. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things I want to mention, 45Q, we talk a lot about the passage of 45Q and what that's meant for the U.S., but something that we hear routinely is from um, the IEA or from foreign governments that they're watching how 45Q is rolled out in the U.S. to see if there are things that they can learn for domestic policies. So I think both from the, the kind of technology and R&D side, um, from the company side, and on um, the, the policy front, how do you guys all think about kind of international cooperation playing into the future for direct air capture. Anybody else want to answer this? Um, so certainly we, uh, in, in um, dis discussing and working with policymakers globally, we see that, um, that everybody is watching everything else that happens and, and wanting to learn from the good ideas that are, are put out there, um, lessons that are learned and, and updating the policies, new policies coming online all across the United States and, and around the world. So it's, it's still emerging, people are learning, um, but uh, there are efforts to collaborate, of course, um, international aviation, international shipping also coming, um, we'll have policies coming online that will regulate the amount of sulfur in, shipi in, in, in shipping or the amount of emissions from aviation. So uh, very difficult, hard to do, even domestically, and then also if you're starting to regulate international flights, um, difficult to try to set policies that are workable, achievable by, uh, by airlines, for instance. Um, so there's no, no, no easy answer, um, certainly an effort to learn from each other um, and also to collaborate when, when they're looking at international um, um, transportation. Uh, that that is going to be regulated uh, in more than one country. So yeah, the ch huge challenge. Yeah. Um, great suggestions in the in the in the Rhodium report for different policy levers that can be pulled to to even further incentivize. Um, and I think I I, I believe that international um, uh, regulators will will look at at the ideas that are here as well as uh, new new good ideas um, that that will help set new policies. As you see new technologies develop, I think 
you know, there's no reason to think that other countries won't try to capture this market also. And I think that's an important piece to realize as well for the U.S. This is something that we've seen for years and tracked at BPC through the American Energy Innovation Council that we see that, you know, the U.S. is not necessarily the leader we like to think ourselves to be in energy technology development. This is an opportunity for a new large market. And I think it does behoove us to really think seriously about not only international cooperation, but competition as well before we we kind of innovate, lose um, the innovations and then the, the intellectual property and then end up just purchasing the direct air capture machines from abroad. I think there's an opportunity for, for us to build here and generally in North America to be nice to our Canadian friends. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I would just add to that. I mean, we're pretty agnostic to where we get the CO2 from. So we, we work with point source emissions and direct air capture. And, but definitely the most inbound requests we've gotten um, have been from Europe and Canada, which I think just is a testament to how policy, strong policy and strong indications in those various countries um, really does drive like the private sector to, to seek um, solutions and opportunities. Okay, I have two more questions before we throw it to the audience. So uh, Natasha and Lori, what do you want policymakers to walk away from this report or from this discussion knowing about the work that you guys do? I, I guess what, what we would like people to know is that deep emission cuts are possible today. Um, and, uh, you know, we will, as we begin to deploy, we will learn um, and, and there will be new innovation and we, we support uh, competition, new innovation. We think lots of new good work will happen in this space, but deep emission cuts are possible. And so set ambitious targets, let the market, let um, companies innovate and, uh, and bring those technologies to market, but it's, it's possible. Yeah, I think from, from our side, I mean, um, you know, we basically are taking a waste a CO2 that's currently a waste and converting it into something that, that has value. And so, um, you know, like we can do something with CO2 and like affect climate and create jobs at the same time. And even though our first, our first markets are smaller volume, they um, have a high margin and can create a lot more impact, economic in, a greater outsized economic impact than um, than even their size, and is really starting this um, this whole market can lead to really huge impacts um, down the line. And secondly, I would say that your policy decisions do matter. We definitely, um, in conversations, policy comes up and indicators matter. And even though we're small and and um, these even larger policies that don't affect us now, just having them in place are really helpful. And certainly having more policies that are uh, more relevant to our, our scale and, and level of imp implementation and TRL level uh, would be even much more impactful. So I would definitely encourage that. It's nice to hear that the Bay Area innovators are not ignoring DC. <laughs> <laughs> Um, last question, everybody. What's your vision, your, your hopes and dreams for direct air capture in the next kind of 10, 20, 30 years? You don't have to go first just because I'm <laughs> <you can't. laughs> um, I guess in, in the next 10, 20, 30, 10, 10, 20, 30 years, uh, we see really two things. So we see world scale production of very low carbon fuels from the CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, those, those, that production will happen in areas with large amounts of renewable energy, so wind, solar, uh, hydro. We'll produce fuels there, and then we'll use the existing fuel transportation network, um, and we'll continue to, to use those fuels because they have a fantastic high energy density, and they're, they're just great products. So world-scale production of those fuels. Um, and we see gigaton scale um, negative emissions where we were pulling the CO2 out of the atmosphere and putting it permanently and safely underground. So uh, easy to imagine that happening within the next uh, 10, 20, 30 years. Yeah, I would love, um, again, like in, in 10 and 20 years for us to see CO2 no longer as a waste product, but as a valuable feedstock and resource. Um, it can be converted into many things and, and utilized to, um, you know, I, I didn't mention this earlier, but you can certainly use it as a biological feedstock and then um, you can have um, a bacteria or other biological products that can make even more enhanced molecules that can become food and other medicines and all these types of things. And so I just imagine a world in which we just have these uh, cycles where we're recycling CO2, we're creating economic value out of a form of waste product, um, and we've 
basically cleaned up our air in the process. And, I, and we still have our 200 passenger uh, intercontinental flights that are made from CO2 neutral fuels. And we still have our cargo ships that are you know, run on CO2 neutral liquid fuels as well. So I think that's just a really great future that we would be building. I think Atasha and Lori have the entrepreneurial ambition. Uh, mine's a little less. Mine is, I would like to see it technologically de-risked, become bankable to the point that we have a better established price um, through long-term support from the Hill, um, through R&D and support of uh, development projects. Um, but really what that can do is, as part of a larger decarbonization part portfolio, having it as part of that mix helps us to also establish kind of a, uh, the, the bounds of the price of mitigation and decarbonization. And I think that it's going to be a critical piece. And I would say that, you know, in, in the shorter term, we'd love to see the scalability and, and the economic opportunity. Um, and, and as a result of that, in sort of the longer term, Oxy has announced that we're trying to figure out how to go carbon neutral. Um, and so using this type of technology, you know, leveraging, leveraging all of the leaders on the Hill to, to talk about carbon pipelines and being able to move the product, um, you know, we'd love to see all of these things working in concert so that we can really make an impact in that way. Great. Thank you, guys. And with that, we're open for audience questions. And again, if you could say your name and affiliation. Sarah Saylor, Earth Justice. Um, thank you all for being here. I really enjoy the conversation and the back and forth about some of these new innovations that can be really exciting. Um, I guess I've been working on this climate problem from a policy perspective for 20 years. And back then it was, we need a transition. 10 years ago is, we need a transition. Today, we need a transition. When well, we've got 10 years, right, to actually effectively reduce the carbon. So we need to start counting the carbon and we need to be doing that very carefully and very well. Um, so I guess I just offer a couple of pu public policy uh, mechanisms that have been trying to spur innovation. We have the renewable fuels standard that was supposed to be first generation biofuels to next generation biofuels. That transition doesn't seem to have made the leap. We have 45Q. In some people's minds, that was supposed to be a transition from enhanced oil recovery to more carbon capture and storage, permanent capture, carbon capture and storage. So I guess I'm curious about what are the policies that we need to enact right away? Um, how do we get this innovation that we're talking about and dreaming about, or the innovation that already exists today? Just get it done, just start actually doing it. I guess that's a question to everybody. Well, I'll just, I'll just start briefly. Um, so using CO2 for our enhanced oil recovery, we are sequestering carbon dioxide permanently in the in the geology of the reservoir. So um, I, I think that 45Q was really a large step for that. And I think that some of the suggestions that John made in his presentation um, will increase the the viability and, and the economic strength of 45Q. Um, we'd like to see more people able to capture carbon, and we'd like to, to have uses for that. So I think that there are a couple of, of policy changes that have been made. And, but I mean, right now, we're still waiting on guidance from the IRS for 45Q implementation. So we haven't seen a whole lot of changes yet because, yeah, it's been a year. <laughs> so we're still waiting on. It's been in place for 10 years. Well, no, but since the, since the amendments last year. Um, so we are, you know, we're, we're still waiting on how those changes can affect what we're trying to do moving forward. So I think that there are a couple of things with 45Q um, that would be very beneficial to, to the continued use, um, at least from, from the oil and gas perspective. Yeah, and I would say policy that does have some deployment encouragement um, would be great. I mean. Um, you know, I'm looking at kind of how the opportunity zone um, policy is is kicking off tons of uh, new smaller project in in these economically depressed um, areas. And you know, if something like that, where it's like it, it acknowledges that it's like small projects, and if that were there for um, sort of carbon utilization, where it's like you do you deploy this project, and because you're deploying it in a carbon utilization and that's new, we're going to give you this like special designation of some sort of um, tax benefit or so cost sharing or something like that. So I, I, yeah, I'm with you. Like I think uh, policies that kind of uh, bridge that gap because there is right now like the SBIR program is wonderful in um, stimulating early stage technologies. And then there's um, once you're at scale and this technology is proven, there's support to kind of uh, help larger companies. And I think 
in the middle there, there's some room for new policies that we haven't tried, I think. But I'm no expert on policy, though. I just want to make that clear. Well, and I'd say um, the Rodian report w that was posted has a lot of specifics. It goes into much more detail on specific policy recommendations about how to actually get these things deployed. It's backed up with a lot of analysis that uh, John and the Rodium team have done. Other questions? Hi, everyone. Ian, Department of Energy. Uh, just want to let you know that the 45Q, uh, the IRS just last week put up a request for comment on 45Q's uh, implementation. So you should all check that out if you have an opinion on how that should go down. Hi, Raghuvir Gupta. From the Occidental point of view, what is the price of Occidental willing to pay for CO2 from direct air capture now and uh, in the future? That's a very loaded question, and it <laughs> takes people a lot smarter than no. I to answer it. <laughs> you know, I mean, there, there are so many factors that go into that, and, and a lot of it is pure speculation. I mean, what happens on the Hill with a carbon tax, and how does that affect? I mean, since we use carbon as an input and an output, our models are, are super complicated, and I won't even pretend to understand all the economics there. I'm sure there are very smart people that understand that much more than I. Okay, the second question I had is, we're talking about low carbon fuels. What is the, where will the hydrogen come from in these things? Well, what are the price of that hydrogen will look like? Uh, so, so in terms of, I mean, there's different ways to, to generate hydrogen. Uh, right. What we've done at our plant in British Columbia is imp impl simply implement an electrolyzer to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And we published a, quite a detailed techno-economic analysis last year of, of, um, of our direct air capture technology. So, uh, so put those two things together and, and you can calculate how much it, it costs us to produce some fuel. Thank you. And, and to be clear, we, we do not use hydrogen in our process. We use water as a source of a proton. Right. But, yeah. Hi, Michelle Hindman, the Energy Impact Center. I'm hoping y'all can speak to the energy requirements for direct air capture and some of the sources that you think would mo be most beneficial for this process, as well as the scale that you really think that direct air capture um, should be implemented at in order to address climate change. Thanks. So in terms of energy requirements, again, the, the paper that we published last year goes through in quite a bit of detail uh, what the energy requirements are. We need to use a, a, a low carbon renewable energy source like wind or solar or hydro uh, to, uh, in our process in order to um, achieve the decarbonization um, negative emissions uh, uh, and, and earn the 45Q or low carbon fuel standard or other kinds of credits. Um, uh, in terms of how much is needed. I guess, you know, we, we brought a new tool uh, in, to put in the toolbox to say we can actually now do direct air capture, either to offset um, the uh, hard to decarbonize um, parts of, of our industries, or also to start to remove some of the legacy carbon, you know, where we're, we're rocketing up the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere above uh, what are safe levels. And so we see it both as decarbonizing today's emissions as well as starting to remove some of that legacy CO2. So um, we're a, a company that's brought a new tool to put in the toolbox, uh, but we leave it to the government to the, to the b very big complicated problem of how do we uh, achieve our overall climate targets. Yeah, hi, just to, to comment on that. I think one of the things I've seen is uh, in really hard to dislodge preconceived notions around direct air capture. And, You've heard some of it uh, come up here even today uh, on the questions about pipelines, for example. The idea that um, you still need, uh, we, we may need as a country pipeline infrastructure for overall portfolio of carbon uh, reduction uh, solutions, but direct air capture really comes from the air. Every, air is everywhere. And this is something that is um, really, as many times as you say it, and I have a decade of saying this, people, it, it, it goes in one ear and comes out the other just because we are human. There's, no, there's nobody's fault. So I just want to emphasize that, that we really are talking about capturing CO2 from air, which is anywhere. Second of all, on the scale issue, 
Um, uh, John made the point earlier about um, direct air capture having the ability to uh, capture air per square meter that's something like 20,000 to 40,000 times as much as bi biological solutions like trees. I love trees, don't get me wrong, and I think we need a full slate of biological solutions. But to that question that was just asked, you really can scale this to the level that solves much of the uh, climate problem without um, taking up the surface of the earth. So I just really want to make that clear to people as well. And on the energy requirement, uh, again, just to emphasize what John said, it's, very, it's been very difficult to convince people that you could take um, something that uh, is dilute in air, which is CO2, at 400 parts per, per million, and cost effectively remove that from the air without using massive amounts of energy. And what John, I think, in this report has said is, you can. So we really need, and, and he showed that they're on the first of a kind plans that carbon engineering, that global thermostat, that Climeworks have done. We're really already getting into a range where you're in the, 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 the pool of different carbon mitigation solutions. So that uh, when we talk, if you take any analogy to solar or wind, we're going to go down that curse co cost curve collectively and be in a place where we don't need to use massive amounts of energy um, or uh, use, uh, ex expend a lot of cost to do this. I know this has all been said today, but it really does, I, I think, bear repeating because it does, again, after over a decade of trying to explain this to people, it, it's, it's hard to take in. So I just wanted to emphasize that. And, and maybe just a comment for us. Um, what we've been working on for the last 10 years is that the target is 1 million tons per year is our commercial scale plant. Um, and, and as John mentioned, uh, we can put the plant anywhere that we have air and water and energy available to us. And so the good news is that the plant, um, often the best answer is to actually locate in a re remote area, non-arable land where there are wind and solar resources available to us. So, so it's a really good um, sort of marrying of, of where those resources are available and, and where we need a, a footprint to be able to put the, the air contactors and, and have a large enough scale. But a, a million tons per year is a, a standard commercial plant for us. We have a couple more minutes if we have any more questions. Okay. Nailed it. Any other, any final comments from our panelists? No? Thanks, Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> Thanks, John. Thanks for the road. Yeah. How are you? Pretty good. You guys are